off we go. So welcome to Managing the Messy Middle part four. So this is the recap. This is like the cliff's notes of the entire thing. So for those of you, and I know you, my straight A students, you're like, I've been here every time. This is going to be redundant for you. Um, but it's also your opportunity to ask Yasmin, Erica, my colleague, or me anything about this messy middle series. And I also uh, brought some um, people who can't be with us today. I brought some of their questions, comments, concerns, etc. So let's jump in. What the hell are we talking about when we say the messy middle? Well, um, you may remember my art project. Let me grab it for you real quickly, right? And the messy middle starts with this presumption. Oh man, if we have time, if we have time and you guys can think of it, ask me to tell you my story about meeting Steve Wozniak last week. Um, okay, that's the reason I couldn't be with you. I was meeting Steve Wozniak last week. Okay, anyway, so when we started the messy middle, we said we can basically agree that this is um, a, well, duh, it's a sine wave. Hi, math nerds. But this is also sort of the symbol of entropy, right? The idea that things grow and then they fade away over time, right? You, you said, yep, generally we're on board with that. And we also agreed that um, because of our, like, um, our often limited view, right? Like we, we often see this much of things. It's, a, it's the cause of being a human life. It's the cause of, uh, we tend to be very now focused, right? We said that if you, if you only look at one of these little life-size slices of this entropy, things can feel really bad or really good, right? And then we agreed that if you widen your frame a little bit, which often comes with age, right, you get wiser with age, you're able to take a wider perspective, then you can see that it's natural that we would have ups and downs and that things change over time. And then we came to the keystone concept of the messy middle, which is this. I'm still using this stupid craft project, even after all these weeks. And I have used it during keynotes. I was with, the, I was with like 1300 members of the California Society of Municipal Finance Officers showing them my stupid art project, but it seems to work. Anyway, so here now we come to the messy middle where we can see that some things are dying, some things are being born, and we've got a we somehow in the messy middle have to cross the gap. But one thing I don't think you guys have seen is this image um, that I created and I wanna share with you now. This wasn't a craft project, this was an overlay. It's, it's far better than a craft project. It is this. So in a moment, you will see the drawing of the messy metal, there it is. That's actually the photograph from my notebook, right? And horizon one are the paradigms, assumptions, infrastructure that's falling away. And the core skill is management because all you're doing is riding herd on something that's cresting and declining. So sort of people want to hang on to the steady state there. Then horizon three is this notion of things are emerging, new ideas are popping up, and this is where the visionaries tend to live. And in the middle, you've got this messy middle. This is where entrepreneurs do very well, right? And here's my overlay. This is one of my favorite photographs. I think it's gonna load. There it is. This is a photograph called the catch, right? And this is what it feels like <laughs> to go through the messy middle. And you can almost see the I tried to make the photograph see-through so that you could see like, oh, there we hurdle between, between the, the bar of the past before we get to the arching body of the catch. We have to go through this messy middle. And it can feel super freaking scary, which is why we designed this series, right? We believe in our shop as futurists, we believe that we are between a system that is receding and we are growing towards a system that is still emerging. It's not fully formed yet, right? 
So how do we navigate the messy middle? Well, I would argue it starts by recognizing that this is where we are and that this entrepreneurial mindset, this willingness to try some things, this willingness to take a few experiments, to try a few experiments, the willingness to maybe you know, mix people up in a different way. This is probably the way that we get from what is falling away to what is waiting to emerge. And um, we laid all of this out in the, in the very first episode. Now, after the first episode of The Messy Middle, and by the way, here's where you can find all of the um, recordings. And Yaz and I are busily turning these into blogs with questions that you can just read and download and pass along to your friends. But for now, this is where we've captured our first three episodes. To get through that messy middle, right? Um, you got to acknowledge that you're there. You have to be willing to do some entrepreneurship. After the first episode, let me go to the mailbag. Stephen Thompson said, um, sorry, I couldn't stay. In your setup, you suggested that the sine wave is a co common pattern in nature. He said, I agree and I argue. That is, it exists in the average. Overall, that is the course of life. However, any individual life is much more complex and therefore. So he shared what he drew as the sine wave for his father's life, right? And he said, we can't just agree that we have these smooth slopes. And I, I have Stephen's permission to share this. Is he on with us today? He's not. Um, but this is of course true. And as we are navigating the messy middle as well, see the bumpy bits? It's gonna be like this. It's gonna be like this. And so um, we have to, as stewards of the messy middle, help people feel comfortable. We're not going for perfection here. We're going for progress, not perfection. We want to have enough air cover to experiment and to take some risks, take some risks. And um, this person did not give me permission to share. I'm just looking to see if she's with us today and she's not with us today. But um, one of the things that she said is, um, hey, uh, how do you encourage your leadership, she's in a situation where they've got a board of advisors. How do you encourage them to take this leap when there's like there's nothing burning? Like they can't smell the smoke that things are on fire. It's the staff who works in it day to day that knows crap is broken. What do you do with that, right? Excellent question. This is what I suggested. She happens to work in a creative industry. And I said, you know, um, this is actually, you should think of this as a feature, not a bug. You know, the fact that you can't get your board on board, think of this as a, a good thing, not a bad thing, because it's going to force you to be even more creative and, and so forth. And I, I said, um, hey, what about using something visual, like um, in the in creative spaces? How can you do something highly visual? So maybe you want to visualize for them, um, you know, going from one to the other. And how far do you think you really are in that? That can visuals picture tells a thousand words, right? I also suggested, and I'm only reading my advice because then you have to read what, what this person said back. I said, um, so in addition to making your first um, project highly visible, maybe you could think about turning the name of it into like Project Leapfrog or Operation Leapfrog. Um, and then how do you get an early win? And this is what she said back. Um, I am gonna have to keep leaning into the visual aspect of this and how to put a new shine on it because it's been a long isolating decade of trying to do this. Um, the newest manager after five years under current executive, the current executive director is tired of the lack of recognition that we need to make the leap. And I'll be honest, you know, when I read something like this, I know that this person is suffering you know, it to try to do this for a decade, that is like a no-win situation. So then if you find yourself in that situation where you're like, I'm trying to get people to be more entrepreneurial, I'm trying to get them to see that the way we've done business is not the way we're going to be doing business, I do think, and I'm speaking to you as individuals, as amazing, talented, visionary, change-making individuals, if you find yourself in that position, I think you have three options, right? Number one is you can accept it. And maybe there's enough payoff that that's worth it for you. I'm just gonna accept it. I'm gonna bite it. We've all done that. 
We've all, I'm looking at this group knowing we have all been in those places where we're just gonna accept it. The second thing you can do is change your relationship to it. Change your relationship to it. This is classic reframing, right? So um, how, how can you change your relationship to it? Like in this case, the person is saying, I'm feeling really deadened and defeated by it. But what if you said, hey, this is the challenge that I'm being given at this moment. And I'm going to give myself one more year of doing my damnedest. And if after a year, after 24 months, whatever your time frame is, I can't change anything, then I'm going to reevaluate my options, right? So option one, accept. Option two, change your perspective to it. Take it as a personal challenge. Take it as a time to like, nobody's paying attention anyway. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. I don't know, whatever it takes to reframe it. Option three is to leave. Option three is to walk away. Um, and all three are valid options. Okay. Um, also, after uh, the first session, um, she, uh, uh, this person is asking, I'm just checking to see if they're here. They are not. This person is asking, how amidst the messiness do we remain open to all the signals, those slight steps in key directions and the potential of a new future that we can co collectively create. She, sa she says, in other words, what ways might we see this as delicious messiness and it's part of our next formation so that we don't just try to like wait it out? You know, how do we see these signals of change as something to energize and engage us rather than to something like, oh, we'll just wait till the kids calm down and then we'll be back to business, business as usual. Um, my first piece of advice on this is please don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. It's too much for one person to try to be the energizer bunny for the entire system or the cheerleader for the entire system. Um, and, and actually I wanna encourage you in this because we have those people in our systems, you know? Um, we have those people who we count on because they always come in with a bright smile and a warm word and a way of reframing things. And I, at this point, I'm actually feeling sorry for those people because I think all of us are leaning on them a little too much, right? We think, well, here comes Rebecca on a Friday. She'll pick us up, right? She'll pick us all up. Well, guess what? It becomes a burden for the person who always has to be the pickup person. So who's the person in your system? And I'm not saying I'm burdened, I love you guys, but I'm just saying, if you're always relying on the same person to be the pickup person, that person needs a pickup person too. So how can you pick them up? Or how can you say, Rebecca, you are always coming in with the, with the magic and the effervescence, I'm gonna take it this week, right? Like, yeah, it's relieved me last week, right? She's like, I'll get, I got this. I'll help them pick kick-ass pilot projects. I'm your girl. She does this for me all the time, right? Everyone needs a yes, right? So maybe you are the person who is seen as the one who's always seeing the opportunity. So maybe there's an opportunity for you to support that person. But the other thing is this. Um, I've talked about this before, but we are storytelling creatures. We are storytelling creatures. And as you are noticing these signals, messy deliciousness as our as our reader writes this messy deliciousness how can you help make that into part of the story right by saying something like i wonder if we're going to be one of these communities or one of these organizations that just ignores these things or i wonder if we're going to be one of these organizations it's like hey guys we can make something out of this right so by wondering those kinds of things out loud, you give people the opportunity to ask themselves, which are we? Which are we? And which one do we want to be? So another way to think about this is, okay, imagine it's 2025. Do you want to be looking back on this COVID and this post-COVID period as a time when you just waited it out or that you used it to just leapfrog you forward? So you guys, I was just on a call. The reason I was a little late to this, I was just on a call with somebody, an organization that has been deeply impacted by the polar vortex. Okay, you've been reading about what's happened with the polar vortex. Now I want you to think about which companies are on the rails because of the polar vortex. I was just on a call with one of those companies and literally they said, now is the time. 
for us to make our big leap because all eyes are on us. And I was like, that is brilliant reframing because there's a lot of like Eeyore, poor me, sad trombone, right? Like, mm -mm, it's not really our fault. The wind didn't blow, blah, 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 right? And instead they're like, this is our moment. We need to reframe this whole situation and use this as the leap forward. And it just, it was like, it was like, everybody got it and was like, you're right. This, that's right. Change the whole conversation. So you can use these delicious ickinesses to spur new conversation. Okay. And the final question. Um, I'm going to actually table this one until we go through the second workshop. Second workshop in the messy middle series was about teams, teams. How do you create these high performing teams? And we started by saying what's been our best experience in teams. And there are some, there were some amazing examples, but there were some things that were absolutely um, kind of uniform. Number one, great teams are working for something beyond themselves. You know, you felt like you were on a mission, you were locking arms with others and you were trying to do something that was bigger than any of you could have done by yourself. And the teams that really lasted were also the teams that sort of had this, um, you know, this, this openness because we've all been chartered onto a team where it's like, we're gonna do something amazing, but then the actual teamwork starts and you're like, Chip's an asshole. Like, I don't wanna be on a team with him. You know, we've all had this experience, right? So the mission sounds great, but then you get into it with people and you're like, wow, I would not wanna spend two more hours with these people every week, if, even if I got paid twice, right? So one of the things we noticed about teams is that there's also this generosity and the research shows that when you experience generosity, you're, there's chemical changes in your body related to oxytocin. So the spirit of generosity that comes out of these teams, that if you can start to manifest those within the team, um, that has really good results. But let me just quickly share some of the key takeaways around great teams. Again, this is under the broad category of you're here for the Cliffs Notes. Let's give them to you. Um, best teams. And I just want to remind you, um, that the research shows that teams that have these, these um, qualities are 40% more effective than those that don't. Number one, psychological safety. Like I can look like an idiot here. I don't have to have the best idea. I don't even have to have the answer, but it's a psychologically safe place to explore. We'll get to that in just a second. Next, these are whole brain teams, right? So it's not just all visionaries. I think that's one of the things that people misunderstand. You know, if you want a, an entrepreneurial team, you don't want it to just be full of the people who want to try new stuff. You also need people who are highly organized, who are going to make sure that the team meets on a regular basis and develops a cadence of accountability. You want the kinds of people who know how to recruit others and bring others along. So you want whole brain teams. And in, in our organization, we think about the, the four um, energetic patterns, right? So they are driver, the kind of folks who know how to get things done, right? The visionary, the person who says, I wonder, and like the, the person who, you know, walks with their head up in the clouds. We all know these people, right? Three, the collaborator, the one who can bring others along. And then fourth, the organizer, right? The one who makes sure that the trains are running on time. So you can think of those energy patterns as a way of designing a whole brain team. You can really simplify it. You can say, we need some pragmatists and we need some idealists. Like maybe that's enough, right? But the idea is whole brain teams, developing that cadence of accountability. Whatever you're gonna do with your team is probably gonna be in addition to this other work right? You're going to run some experiments. You're going to try to be entrepreneurial in a certain area, and you're going to be asking people to also do their normal day job. So these teams need to have a cadence of accountability. Okay. Um, this is shocking, but the science shows us the right number for a team is two. So there's no excuse that you need to have a big team to get things done. Right. And then I already talked about this notion of generosity generosity, um, how important that is. So if you're the convener of a team, this can start with like, you know, the first two, three minutes are like, hey, what do we need to do um, 
<laughs> oh, thanks, Daniel. That is a great question. How do you reconcile the right numbers too with getting a whole brain team? Yasmin and I are an excellent example of this, right? I am visionary collaborator. She is organizer. What is your other, your second support pattern? Uh, I think collaborator too. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so between the two of us, we're 75% there. The only thing we're missing is somebody knows I get things done, right? But yeah, so <laughs> the idea, Daniel, it's a good one is none of us is just, well, very few people are only visionary or only driver or only collaborator, right? Most of us have a nice blend uh, of those things. So look, so look for that. Um, we really do all need a yes. Uh, if you are- Oh, visionary, thank you. Yes. <laughs> That's so cute. To find people who have that mix, because you're right. I mean, it is, it is <laughs> important that we all have different perspectives, but I also have seen a lot of people lean really heavily into one of those. And so there wouldn't be a whole brain team with just two people. You got to have the right people. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You either have to have the right two people or you need a bigger team. And Daniel, so you, we had that great conversation after the second meeting about, you know, two being magic number. And you asked me a really challenging question, which I haven't been able to stop thinking about. Um, do you want to share the question and share any additional thoughts you've had about it? Uh, the question was, so with biomimicry or living systems, wondering what life, what, what uh, natural examples are there of these two member teams? Because a lot of things that I see with kind of biomimicry are the swarming or the flocking, um, schools of fish, murmurations for when you talk about biomimicry and teams. And I still and don't have a good answer yet. I'm okay. still working on it. All but right. I, I, so you though said, what do you mean non-human? Because I think there's a lot of good, good examples of human pairing, but sometimes the human ego gets in the way. And so it's harder to translate the wisdom of nature from just a, a, an anthropological example. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, we talked about like in Silicon Valley, there's the famous, it's like the Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, right? The nerd and the hustler. Uh, that is a famous Silicon Valley pairing for startups. But I just um, learned about another one since we were last together, which is um, lichen. Lichen are um, a symbiotic unit between an, ame an amoeba and something else. Anyway, fungus and algae. Yes, a fungus and an algae. A Thank fungi. You. A fungi. You are a fungi, Daniel. Um, so I, I can even tell bad dad jokes. That's, that's just how I go. Um, but no, a fungi and an algae. And an algae. So the, you look in nature, you think about marriages. Many marriages are two people. They don't all work. I mean, we, we can admit that. But look what, look what partnerships can do in terms of bringing new people into the world. That's amazing. That's something you cannot do by yourself, right? So what's more entrepreneurial than a little bit of you and a little bit of me creating some other thing happening out there, right? Okay, so Enough about that. I feel like I'm going into slippery territory and then maybe people with HR backgrounds here. So, um, and then the final thing about great teams is this notion of the three E's, right? That you want to goose these teams with energy, keep their energy up. This is why that cadence of check-in is probably once a week, right? To kind of keep the cadence moving. You want people, everybody should have a job, right? And all those jobs matter. So people are engaged. They're part, they're doing part of it. They're not just attending the meeting and listening to the book report. They have a role to play. And then the third E is this notion of being externally curious, because think about any entrepreneurial project you might want to do to go from systems that are receding to systems that are emerging, right? you probably are gonna to wanna to look to nature, biomimicry, or to other, if you're in public accounting, what can you learn from other professional service firms? What can you learn from other countries, right? What is Angela Merkel doing in rebuilding the German economy that's bringing so many great um, sustainability benefits, all these co-benefits, and you know what can we learn from that? So the great teams tend to not just be belly button gazers of like, how can we put our, just our assets together? But it's like, what ideas do we need to recruit into the team? Where else can we get inspired? Okay, so that's a little bit about, um, about the teaming. So one of the questions I got after teaming was, hang on just a second, I'll stop sharing. One of the questions I got after teaming was, um, okay, how do you team when people are working from home? Excellent question. 
Excellent question. In my opinion, it does take a little more prep. It takes a little more prep, but people inherently know how to work together. <laughs> it's just something we know how to do. And doing it like this, is it a feature or is it a bug? I actually think it's a feature, right? Because without any transportation, without any expense, I can bring an alloy Zell into my team. And be like, Al, I'm working on this thing. What do you got, right? And we can bring him in as needed. So for the purpose of experimentation and entrepreneurship, I actually think the technology and working at a distance is a, is a, is a feature, not a bug. Um, do, do, do. How do you keep your peers in the loop? So <laughs> this is honestly something that happens. You've probably been on a team where like people know you're getting together and then the echo starts to happen. Like they're like, mm, Tamara, I heard you're working on this team. How do, and they, they, they don't say it, but they start feeling a little jealous or maybe curious. Curiosity comes before jealousy. They're like, should I be jealous? Should I be jealous, right? So you need, you need a set of agreements within your team about how that's gonna look. I've seen some teams who are like, we're gonna keep a lid on everything we're doing. Our conversation is gonna be minimal because maybe you're in a system that is gonna shit all over your idea because that's just what you do in your system. So in that case, you want your team sort of sworn to secrecy. We are not gonna talk about this until we're ready because we don't wanna put the fire out before we've even got a blaze going. In other teams where um, maybe there's a little more trust, right? A little more goodwill, a little more kindness. You might want to be absolutely transparent, even create like an intranet site, right? That says, here's the team. Here's the challenge we're working on. We welcome all good ideas. Uh, you know, you may be invited to a future meeting. We hope you say yes, right? So you really have to gauge it on your culture. You have to gauge it on your culture. Um, determining what to share. And then, okay, final question that uh, this person asked is, what if your experiment goes totally wrong? Or what if we find that we need to adapt? This actually is a time for you to say, to hold your hand up in the air and say, delight, delight. I went to a happiness camp and one of the teachers of happiness camp said that it, one of the mindsets of happiness is to look for delight. And she said, and if you compare a physical activity with finding delight, you are likely to be happier. So now whenever I'm delighted by something, I put my hand in the air, my finger in the air, I say, delight, you know, and I say sunset or delight fresh coffee, whatever it is, right? So if you run into something that needs to be adapted, something that didn't work, put your finger in the air and say delight, because that is the point of entrepreneurship, to test what works and what doesn't. So to, to think about that. Now, another person um, set me straight about these three words. I'm gonna put them in the chat. So he, he made, um, some of you will remember that I did this blog post called Ox, Oxen Don't Pivot. And um, the key image was this big boy right here. Could be a big girl. I don't know. Do, do girl ox have these horns? Maybe they do. I don't know. Anyway, this, this they, right? They were the focus of the blog. And the point I was making is that I'm hearing everyone talk about 2021 is the year of the pivot. And I said, dude, pivoting is a terrible idea if you really don't yet know where you're going, right? And if you look at the Chinese calendar, 2021 is the year of the ox. What is the ox about? The ox is about steady, persistent, forward movement. That's what we need in 2021. We need these oxen to help plow the way through the messy middle. Now, after I said that, I got some feedback from one of our participants who said, Rebecca, I don't know if you're using the word pivot in the right way. And he said that in the innovation space, so this is lean startup, agile startup, minimum viable product, people who do like those design sprints, especially in high tech, there are three words that they use pivot, punt, or persevere. And he questioned me on pivot because he said, pivot means the vision still holds, 
but you just need to kind of change how you're going to get to the vision. So that's what pivot means. The vision remains, but how you're going to get there changes. Now let me punt means, oh man, our vision is not right. And the experiments we're running to try to get there, neither one is right. We have to blow this up and we have to punt, like see where this goes, right? Persevere is when things are working and you're not sure what the vision maybe is, but you're gonna keep trying to run the experiments and hope that things sort themselves out. So it's probably clear from those three definitions that any of those three could work in a messy middle situation. And that's what all of startups are. That's what entrepreneurship is, right? It's trying stuff out. But I'm gonna defend myself on this one. And I defended myself to him in an email. And I said, I think pivot is the right word. Um, or that pivot is not the right word, excuse me, for this time, because I don't think most of the people I'm hearing talking about 2021 as a year for the pivot, I don't think they've rethought where they're going. I don't think they've, they've questioned, is my business model the right business model? Is this the way that I define success in 2019 the way I'm going to define success in 2025? I don't think most executives, most leaders have looked at that visionary endpoint. So for them to say, we're just going to pivot, we're just going to change how we get there, I'm not buying it because I don't get the sense that they know where there is, where the there is. So I'm, I'm still standing behind my 2021 is not the year for pivot. Oxen don't pivot. 2021 is the year for navigating the messy middle with that steady, consistent growth. All right. So we've been through week one, week two. Now, Yaz, would you please do a tidy summary of what happened last week about how we choose kick ass projects? Sure thing. I have one slide I can share with everyone. Uh, so let me just pull that up real quick. Hopefully, if you can see something in the window. Okay, let's go here. So uh, last last week I shared six steps as a as a process to do over and over again, and this is the big picture of the process. So one is start with the right kind of question. I'm calling it a generative question here. Uh, what that means is take the thing you are trying to create, the change, whatever improvement you are trying to convey, take that topic or that issue and turn it into a question that invites creative thinking. It does not already define all the answers or, or any answers. Like the solution space must be off the chart, wide open. Um, for that question, for that issue you're trying to answer. Um, and also what this question should do is invite excitement and engagement from you, from anybody else on your team who's trying to uh, brainstorm with you potential ideas that could be uh, pilot projects. This question has to also elicit engagement or, or energy from them. So have a special kind of question. Step number one, everything starts from there. Um, let's see, step number two, oh. this is very fun. Okay, here we go, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> step number two is, okay, you started with a question, right? Every one of you has assets. There may be physical assets, like a space or a tool, or you've got skills um, that are all relevant uh, to potentially answering that question. You don't know yet how, but they're relevant to bring up, maybe this could be used to answer this question that we came up with in step one. So I said, what did I say? I said physical assets, uh, skills, social networks, professional networks, or maybe informal networks you're part of, they could be relevant, or you've got access to capital. Maybe you just happen to have um, discretionary spending, maybe not. Whatever it is, come up with a list of assets that you and every one of your teammates has that might be able to help you answer this question. Then in the next step is you connect the dots between these assets. Um, now I should clarify that these assets are not just 
you don't just have them, but you are also willing to share them with your teammates. I should clarify that. Uh, but once you have this list, you connect two or more assets together. What, what could that, that combination, what is that idea that could help answer the question that you came up with in the first step? Brainstorm as many different ideas as you can, then pick your top three or four that really speak loudly to your team, like, oh, there's something here. Or yeah, this is a this is this is a very different idea from this one. Whatever it is, pick three to four of them and choose, figure out which one of them is the big easy. And the big easy is not the biggest, it is not the easiest, it is both. It is both. What is both the biggest in terms of impact and relatively the easiest to execute? That's the one you're looking for as a pilot project. Now, just because something is maybe mathematically or objectively, like because you scored it high impact and easy in execution, it does not necessarily mean it is the most exciting thing to execute. So come back to, is your team, do you feel excited about this project that you're about to flesh out further? So one gut check, if you will, or emotional check on your choice and then when you're ready for it, well, <laughs> I think you all know how to do this part. You take an idea and you turn it into, all right, what does that mean? How do we execute this? What are some deadlines? Who else do we need to do this? You, you come up with a plan for how to execute this one pilot project, which is a test, which is a learning experience. And when you execute it, you learn from it. There is really, I think, was it Nick Kittle who said it in one of our other sessions? It's not really that you're failing, you're always learning and you're using that learning to become better and come up with the next iteration or to scale it up. Um, so maybe there is no failure. <laughs> it's, it's what you make of it. It's how you frame the outcome or the results you get. So this is the big picture result uh, process I shared last time. Um, and then we did an exercise on how might you develop a generative question in the first place. Um, and that, that question I, I gave a lot of hints is it's, it feels open. It does not give away the answer and it's exciting. Um, and, and it's meaningful to the participants and it's still relevant to what you're trying to address. So that's a lot to ask of a question, but it's, it's, a, it's a secret sauce. <laughs> and once you learn how to do that kind of a question um, and you know, I mean, just a tiny little sidebar this is the year for good questions. This is not the year to try to have answers. This is the year for big questions, for bigger questions, more probing questions, the kind of questions that create insight. Um, but uh, in the chat, I kind of chatted out each of the six steps. So step one, the example I gave was uh, of, a, of a big question is, imagine that our department is a model for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right, that is, a, that is a question that for me would generate a lot of excitement, right? I'm thinking about Al, like what you guys are dealing with. Like imagine that our community um, had higher levels of health, fitness, and a sense of well-being, you know, two years from now than we do today. I'm just trying to think about some of the other uh, places that you are. So each of, in the chat, I've, you know, listed it all, you're free to, free to cut and paste. So um, now what we wanna do is we wanna kind of, be quiet and we want to know what questions you have about step one what is the messy middle step two how do you assemble a kick-ass team right that has the has the the mission of experimentation and learning and trying to get us from what's not working anymore to, to the new. And then step three, how do you pick these kick-ass pilot projects? And I'm, I'm gonna just full disclosure here, part, you're helping us with your questions because we are trying to refine an offering that we can deliver like from the start of a month to the end of a month to take teams through this entire process and they will have executed some sort of a pilot project that they're gonna learn something from, at least one. So um, we think this model has legs. Uh, we think that this is something that a lot of teams would benefit from. And any questions you have of us at this point are gonna help us refine this framework um, and refine this offering. So Hannah says, uh, I'm confused on the upward and downward orange line of the messy middle graph. What are those parts? Oh, Hannah, 
What a great question. Okay, so it's this was actually three sine waves. So this was the sine wave of something that's uh, losing its relevance. This is the sine wave of something that is peaking. And this is the sine wave of something that is emerging. So that was the third, that was the third sine wave. Yeah. Uh, yes, of course you missed it because I never said it. It's not so much you missed it as I missed it. Let's just, you're so generous. You've released some oxytocin in me. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Demonstrating good to me. What other questions do you have? And honestly, we're small enough that if you wanna take yourself off mute and we can hear your beautiful, your beautiful voices, we would love that. We know it was a lot like drinking from a fire hose. Um, hi, I've got hi. a question about the generative question. And yes. when you're, sometimes I've experienced the sharing a question like that gets a response of that's too big, it's too open. They mm -hmm. don't know how to support something that's so open and they want to like narrow it down. So how do you, what's some mm -hmm. advice for kind of talking people through that and not being afraid of being so open? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I would do, okay, here's what comes to my mind. Start with the question that is not necessarily generative. Have, have them or have you all spell out directly the thing that comes into your mind. It's typically a problem oriented question. Like why, how can we fix X? Um, whatever that sentence is, or that question mark, have them write it down. That's probably as specific to the situation to be addressed as possible. And then work together to evolve from that, to convert that very specific question, to open it up, the solution space from there. So instead of starting with this wide open question, they, they may find it easier to see where they like to start with a question that most directly speaks to what they want to address and then walk together through a few edits. I'm going to spell those out in a blog post coming soon, uh, but have worked together to, to edit this question so that it doesn't already give away how to, the answer of how to accomplish it. Um, and, and it's a little bit more um, evocative, if you will, but you don't want to, yeah, you're right. It's, you don't want to step so far out that, you know, you're trying to improve services and you end up with a question about how to save the world. Like that's not, <laughs> you don't want to go that far. Um, but that's, that's, I think that's my, my first uh, instinct to, to start the process in real time with the, with the most specific question and work backwards. I would just you say? jump in and, and say too that with, you know, this is about the intersection of both the strategic doing methodology and strategic foresight. So mm -hmm. it's really challenging to come up with a good generative question if you haven't done the first part. And so engaging people using the messy middle um, asking them to think about what's happening around them or map their context, I think helps um, to, to get them comfortable with that frame, mm -hmm. to ask a question big enough, but pointing in a particular direction. Because I think there's a, there's a fine balance point, right, between big enough that you're not telling people what the answer is, but not so big that people feel like they're swimming in an ocean that, uh, and they can't see the shore. This is such a great example of how the sum is greater than the parts, right? Because I would not have thought to say either of the things that my, that Leslie nor Yaz have said. But Kate, I was thinking about your question from a different way, which was maybe you or someone on your team is really good at asking the big generative questions and it makes people shy away from, oh my God, I don't wanna take on something that big. Like the example I used about imagine our department was a model for DEI. Like that I can see where that feels intimidating to some people, but remember that the point is to start with that big question 
And then you get down to the point of your big easy after going through all of these steps, right? So that's maybe the question we're gathering around. But if Kate and Yaz and Leslie and Debbie put their assets together, all of a sudden they're gonna realize, oh, the project, the tiny project that we can do that could have the greatest possible results on this big question is this, is this project. So for people who have resistance around how big it is, it does end up getting much more manageable in size, but better to start big so that when you get smaller, it still feels exciting than to start at a medium size. And by the time it gets to the, 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 the project, you're like, well, this is gonna take four minutes. Let me just dash off an email. Why, we didn't have to spend an hour doing this. See what I'm saying? So it's, it's, a, it's a matter of scale and size. You start big and you, and you come down to size. Um, and by the way, in the first episode, um, I took people through a um, guided journaling process where we talked about what's dying and what's being born. And Kate, in your case, you may want to, you know, give those questions out to people before your first meeting so that they are thinking about what are the systems that are eroding and what are the systems that are being born? Because that may also help them come in with the right mindset about um, a bigger question. Who whom else? What other questions do you have for us? I'm not gonna lie, you guys are the last thing I'm doing before I go to celebrate my birthday. That's why I'm so happy, Today, right? But what well, thanks, Joan G. Say? Oh, what does your shirt say? I only see the top. Okay, I'm going to show you. And when I wore the shirt today, I said, it's my birthday. I'm going to wear whatever the hell I want to wear today, which is why I'm wearing a sweatshirt. I do that uh, every day. Bless your heart. I try, <laughs> I try to dress for y'all, like put on a little turtleneck or a little jacket. Um, but I want to I want to start. I will tell you what's on the shirt, but I want to start by saying this first. Back in the day when I was doing a lot of speeches about best places to work. And so Debbie and Risa, like you guys are in my posse, right? Um, you knew me well back in that day. Um, I used to always give this example of Harley Davidson, where it was one of the only brands I knew where both the customers and the employees would put the Harley logo on their ass. They would get a tattoo of the logo of the company. I mean, that is love for a company. And so the, after I put this on today, I remembered that. And here's what my sweatshirt says. It says, for the future. Thank and, you. and I thought, how lucky am I that my job is to do something that I'm proud to put on a sweatshirt? Like that is, that's a, it's a great birthday realization. So thank you for asking, Joan G. Happy birthday. Hey, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for all the nice happy birthday wishes. Um, well, it looks like we've kind of come to the end of the questions. I don't see any more in the chat. Yes, do you have any questions of me? You know, I was thinking earlier. I knew you were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's the three horizon model, right? Okay, we yep. got this. We get the three curves. Very nice. And then there are the things we tend to do with clients, like scanning or ah. scenario writing or the big sword mm -hmm. and i was just trying to figure out that wh where would these foresight methods fit in this model where <laughs> where would you stick up <laughs> well so. for scanning for scanning that is all about what's dying and what's emerging right because when when we when as futurists when we scan for trends we always say a trend is something that is showing movement it's not a fixed fact in time. It's something that's declining. It's something that's rising. So those trends in the scanning phase show you where the sine waves are, right? So that's where I, there. The scenarios, four stories in our case with our clients, four stories about the future. That is showing from whatever is happening in system one or horizon one, that is showing four possible leaps into the future. It's like, if, you know, this is the challenging future that just bottoms out. This is maybe the expectable future, right? With the one with all the bubbles and 
the bubbles and bumps in it, right? The expectable future. And then you've got these aspirational futures that are much closer to that visionary horizon three. So that's how I would think about uh, the scenarios. And then what else did you ask about? Scanning the big sort. The big sort, right. same, yeah. same thing. I think with that shows, are we, are we having a hard time dealing with what's dying? Or are we having a hard time dealing with what's emerging, right? Because the, at the end of the big sort, people have to say how ready they are for the trends. It's a huge moment of insight for people as they're like, shit, we are not ready for most of the things that are happening in our field. It's, and it, that's normal, right? We're all very good managers. We are very good managers. Uh, we know how to manage to the quarter, to the year. Um, so um, that's, that would be my response to that. What a challenging and excellent question. Thank you. And I then, have a question for you, Yes. Yeah. Oh, wait, okay. you have another one? For, okay, I have a question Oh, no, for you. I don't. I wanted to bring up Karen's question, but okay, go ahead. Okay, okay. So my question for you is, um, I mean, I believe in this model of strategic doing, of like getting these small teams super focused on these innovative things that are doable, they don't require permission, they don't require um, budgets, but how do you stack those things up in a way that it can influence the system. You know, mm -hmm. what would you say to somebody who's like, great, we're gonna do four pilot projects. We happen to be a $400 million organization with 3,500 employees and we're responsible to 835,000 residents. How are four pilot projects gonna get, get me there? What do you say? A couple of things, what I would say is, don't just pick any four pilot projects that sound cool and exciting and all that good stuff and that are relevant, but stack them in a sequence. So it's like a series of domino pieces. And the first one, whatever you learn from it and whatever successes you have, fuels into the next one, fuels into the next one. And each domino piece that comes next is a little bit of a bigger project and a bigger project, more momentum, more people who bring their assets into it. So it's a little bit of um, starting starting a storm. I don't know what you want to, <laughs> what analogy you want. So thinking of it that way, I think in terms of, I think that'll help both, both increase your impact over time with each succession, uh, get, get more um, visibility and support developing all of that. Um, because a system, yeah, right. I mean, a system is very good at continuing to operate when you have a little blip <laughs> going on here. That doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily do anything. So I think um, build a, build a, I have these terrible analogies. Um, what is it when the mountain starts to slide on you? Landslide. <laughs> yeah, build a landslide. <laughs> that's basically what it is. <laughs> Let gravity do the work. I, that's actually, I, I really like that as an example. Okay, the Steve Wozniak story. Um, avalanche. Yes. Avalanche. Thank you, teamwork. Steve Wozniak story. So next week is Govapalooza. If you are a local government nerd or if you work with local governments in any way, next week there's this event called Govapalooza. And it is literally like a Burning Man meets Leslie Nope. It is going to be amazing if you are a nerd uh, in local government. And I'm going to be keynoting the last day and Yaz is going to be on a panel. Uh, on, anyway, Steve Wozniak is our opening speaker. And there was a small chance that the CEO of the organization was not going to be able to be there on the opening day. And so he asked me to come in case I needed to pinch hit for him and be the person who was going to be interviewing Steve Wozniak. So I was like, very happy to meet Steve Wozniak. Okay, you guys. So we met like this, right? But not on Zoom. It was some platform I had never heard before. It wasn't Microsoft Teams. It wasn't Cisco WebEx. And I was the first one there. And first of all, can I tell you, um, he was like, instead of talking, he was holding up signs that said things like, ha ha. And, you know, which is kind of funny. And you know who could resonate with that? Me. Because what do I do all the time? I hold up freaking handmade drawings. So here's what I held up for him. First, I just held up this. And he said, Oh, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to put that in my repertoire. He's like, I also need a champagne glass. So then I drew him this. And we were having like our own secret love language. Like we were like out doodling each other. But here, here was the best part. Oh, hang on, I gotta stop the recording.